What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Blood on the Razor Wire TV. I just want to thank everybody for the kind words and, you know, all the support. Everybody knows we've been in the hospital the last couple days. My wife had um, two little boys, Chase and Charlie. Chase was 5.8 pounds. Um, Charlie was 5.2. Or let me switch that around. Charlie was 5.8 and Chase was 5.2. But anyway, I came home for a couple hours. We're still going to be in the hospital for a day or two. But I definitely look forward to getting back at you. So today, while I'm home, came home to clean up, take care of the dogs, take care of a few things at the house. But while I'm here, I'll figure why not shoot something out to everybody. As you know, we've been doing the Blood on the Razor Wire chapters. Supposed to be members only. But for some reason, YouTube's been shooting them out. So today, we're going to shoot out a public Blood on the Razor uh, Wire reading from the book. And we're going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about my experiences and what it was like. So let's start at chapter six today. Kelly meets me in the day room. My eyes adjust to the lights as Kelly reaches his hand out. How'd you sleep, man? Not bad, I lie. My night had not been good. How could it have been after all of Mr. Young's stories? The morning has just begun and I'm already dreading what stories my cellmate will tell me once we are locked in tonight. You hungry, Chad? Starving, I respond. They should be calling Chow any minute, bro. A correctional officer unlocks the door to the unit and calls Chow. I follow behind Kelly and we make our way to the mess hall. The hallway is crowded with what looks like a herd of inmates. People are yelling back and forth as they hurry to breakfast. As we approach the mess hall, Kelly says, just follow me. There are two doors with two serving lines. We fall into the line that the white and Hispanic inmates form. Black inmates form their own line on the other side. All lies, at least those belonging to the other inmates, are on us. We pick up empty food trays and slide them on a counter. Different inmates put different food items on each tray. First scrambled eggs, then oatmeal, two biscuits, and a heaping scoop of gravy. After eating slop in county jails and in Youngstown, Ohio, I'm a little excited about the food on my tray. The white inmates sit in their own area of the mess hall, as do the black and Hispanic inmates. Both Kelly and I make our way to the white section. An inmate with a fully tattooed face asks, who you ride with? Kelly takes control. In an aggressive voice, he says, we're independents. Where do we sit? Tattoo face points to a table at the end of the line. As we sit down, Kelly whispers, Man, I hate those gang dudes, bro. They think they are tough. They ain't shit for real. I ask Kelly what the hell this car thing means. He explains a car is a group of people that stick together for good and bad. After a long explanation, I conclude a car is nothing but a gang with a more polite name. For example, a car might be a group of inmates from New York. The leader is someone everyone looks up to. He has the keys. In other words, he's the driver. The whites have a bunch of different sects. Some are white supremacist gangs. Some are white guys with no gang affiliation. But there is one supreme leader who has the keys for the yard for all the white inmates. The same goes for the black and Hispanic inmates. In prison politic hierarchy, I am labeled a white independent. I don't belong to a gang or a group. For the most part, I am at the low end of the totem pole around here and on my own. Being on your own in prison is not the best choice. When you are by yourself in prison... It's like being a lone, zire, lone zebra near a pride of hungry lions on the African plains. Even on day one, it's easy to see that as a zebra in here, you can easily find yourself in a bad situation. Plus, vultures are lurking all over the place. Once breakfast is over, we head to the prison laundry for our government-issued clothing. The process takes hours. We stand in a line in the hallway. There's nothing like clothes shopping at the local mall, but this is still America. There will be commerce. As I wait in line, various inmate vendors attempt to sell me a variety of products. Sneakers, Walkman radios, and cigarettes. One guy offers to sell me heroin. I decline the offers. Laundry issues me two pairs of khaki pants, two shirts, brown boxer shorts, t-shirts, socks, a Velcro belt, a pair of new boots, heavy as cinder blocks. After the laundry process, we head to the medical department where a variety of tests are done on me. More questions are asked and answered. Shortly after the medical process is finished, I make my way to the commissary. I buy my own sneakers, some personal clothing, hygiene products, and some food. Big Sandy is like a small town. There's an infirmary as the hospital, at the hospital, a commissary instead of a department store, a chapel for a church, exercise yards as a park, gym as a health club, mess hall as a restaurant, correctional officers as their own little police department, and even a jail inside the prison. The jail is called the special housing unit but there is nothing special about that place. The afternoon will bring a new aspect to my life in this small town. 
There was no way to avoid the recreation yard. I'm told some of my other homeboys want to meet me. Once lunch is over, inmates are permitted to go to the yard. This is not an adventure that I look forward to, but one I must embark on. Chapter 7 Once again, the hallways are alive. Inmates off to work. The education department, chapel in the yard. I find myself walking through a metal detector that is unplugged. The machine is here to serve a purpose, to prevent prisoners from going to the yard with knives or weapons. It quickly becomes clear that the metal detectors are no more than decoration, ornaments dangling from a Christmas tree. There's no correctional officer present to man the machine, even if it were plugged in. The only purpose this thing seems to serve is that when important people show up for an inspection, they look good. When I step out of the building, the sun hits my skin for the first time in a long time. My skin glistens and I inhale the fresh mountain air. The air teeters on the edge of my nose and tickles my lungs. The warm sun and the fresh air feel good and trigger my thoughts. My last day as a free man bangs about in my subconscious mind. I think of it as if it were just yesterday, although it has been years. This is the closest I have been to freedom in five years. The thoughts sting, awakening a pain deep inside my heart. The county jails that I have been, in, been living in have no outside yard. There was no sun to see, or fresh air to breathe, nor any wind to feel. I begin to reflect on my life as I walk through the gauntlet of fences, gun towers, and razor wire. What has my life become? I ask myself as I scan the yard. The yard is not one big yard. Rather, it is one big field separated into four areas. Each section is separated by fences, gates, and locks. The tops of the fences are adorned with spirals of gleaming razor ribbon. The main yard is a quarter mile track with a makeshift football field that also doubles as a soccer field in the middle. Benches and tables are scattered around the yard. They all belong to different groups, gangs and cars. This makes finding a place to sit down and enjoy the weather difficult. I survey the rest of the yard. There's a small portion where two walls sit on a concrete slab. This is where the inmates play handball. Further down in a volleyball court sitting in its own sand pit. To the right are two horseshoe pits. There's another large area that contains a neatly tailored baseball diamond. I feel the wind again as it whips across the fresh cut grass, the sun dazzling off the blades. Now I know why Kentucky is called the bluegrass state. A bluish tint dances on the grass as my mind takes me back home. While I gaze at the diamond, I'm back in middle school, playing second base, waiting for the batter to swing at the ball. I snap myself back to my reality. This is not the place for daydreams. The last yard is behind me. It's made up of basketball courts, tables on the sides. I focus on one area of tables. There's a table with a white sheet tied on top of it. It flaps slightly in the breeze. A precision blackjack replica has been drawn on the sheet. The other sheets are similarly decked out. Hand-drawn carbon copies of poker tables. This looks like they were stripped off a Las Vegas gambling table at Mandalay Bay, but in reality, they are simply prison-made gambling paraphernalia. My moment of peace was broken by a black inmate who introduces himself as Hustle Man. He has a display of different items for sale. There are sneakers, boots, clothes, magazines, artwork, homemade cars that look better than Hallmark and food items. The crown of this little flea market stands stand is the sneakers. He tragically placed one sneaker on top of the boxes with the other inside. You new here, ain't you, Hustle Man asked? Just got here yesterday. Where you from? New York, upstate. Oh yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, and there are a bunch of homies from New York on this yard. Might be two or three from Rochester. You running with the white boys, though? Yeah, man, you know how that goes. Shit, that don't mean you can't spend no money with the Hustle Man, though. I got everything for sale. What you need, man? I'm good. I just went to commissary. Hold up, Rochester. I got something the commissary ain't got. I got the ladies, my friend. He rifles through a bag and pulls out a stack of over 200 photos. He hands me the stack of photos. I shuffle through them, all attractive women. Some are naked. Others have very little clothing on. I told you, Rochester, I got what the commissary ain't have, he says with a sly smile. His entrepreneurship skills are on full display. I am reminded of the hustlers in Manhattan with three-card molly and the ball and cup game. This guy strikes me as the guy that runs hustles in New York City when he's not in prison. Hustle man has me with the photos. It's been a long time since I've seen a naked woman, even if she's only in a photo. How much for the photos, I ask? Naked ladies go for eight stamps. The other sexy things go for four. I got a deal for you because you're from Rochester. Too naked, too sexy, one book. I look at Hustle Man as if he's speaking a language I do not know, and he senses this. Ain't no one told you how to money work around here, huh? Nah, not really, man. Boy, you green as a motherfucker, ain't you? Look here, money, money around... Here are stamps, posted stamps. Every stamp equals 25 cents. 
At this, he pulls some stamps out of his pocket to show me. Some of them are very old. Others look new. You got to have spending money on you, Rochester. You wasn't running around broke out there, was you? Nah, I wasn't broke. Okay, how much time you got? Forty years. Holy shit, was you killing people or making money, he laughs. I respond with the usual crack case. Man, them white folks ain't playing up there in Rochester. Anyway, with that kind of time, you're going to have to find you a hustle. It takes money to make money. I hand Hustle Man back his stack of photos and tell him I will get back to him when I get some stamps. Hustle Man hollers at me when I'm about 10 feet away. Rochester, don't be coming back window shopping my ladies without no money in your pocket. I don't play about my ladies. He says this with a chuckle as I try to distance myself from him. I can't help but laugh to myself as I walk around the track. I haven't seen any violence yet. And this place reminds me of a flea market. People are selling all kinds of things. Tootsie Pops, sodas, deep fried burritos that they call chimichangas. The changas are stuffed with meat, cheese, onions, peppers, and ramen noodles. Fresh mountain air fills my lungs and the sun beats on my face. Things that I, like so many, took for granted are now forever precious. In and out, out and in. I find myself satisfying my lungs with the gulps of the fresh air. Prison makes me realize how valuable freedom truly is. The sun seems contaminated by the characters I see in the yard. Some of these men look, they walk, look like they walk straight out of a horror flick. Many of the white inmates are covered in tattoos. Some of them have their faces painted with ink. It's hard to understand why anyone would do that to their face. And now I understand what the lieutenant meant when he told me not to get tattoos on my face. His advice was appreciated, but not needed. Never in ten lifetimes would I do such a thing. A white, a white inmate introduces himself to me as half-dead. The shock on my face must have been evident. The name half-dead is because I'm half-dead. Life sentence, bro. Half-dead comes across as a guy who fears no one and nothing. There's a tattoo across his forehead that reads, White Pride. The rest of his head, neck, and body are tattooed in neo-Nazi signs. A portrait of Adolf Hitler covers his right side along with the numbers 14 and 88. I ask half-dead, what's the 14 mean? It stands for the 14 most important words to the white race, he tells me. We must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children, he says. How about the 88, I ask, curious. The 88 stands for 88 precepts, or ideas for conscious living of the white man. My first thought is half dead would have fit in many years ago at the Nazi party back in Germany in 1933. He likely would have been a good SS soldier under Heinrich Himmler or some other crazed Nazi. My second thought is, this is one of the guys Kelly warned me to stay away from. The numbers 14 and 88 are products of a man named David Lang. Half Dead decides to give me a white history lesson. I listen out of curiosity. I gather from his lecture that Mr. Lang's objective in life was to rob enough armored trucks and banks to fund the purchasing of a substantial amount of land in the northwestern United States. Once the land was purchased, he planned on it becoming a new homeland for the white race. Lang had Adolf Hitler and Nazi, Germany ambitions. In the end, though, he only succeeded in becoming a federal prisoner and dying in a cell. From what I gather, David Lang has a lot of influence with the white prison gang members. Most of them have a 14 and an 88 tattooed on their bodies. More white inmates are now flocking to the yard, and as the new white guy, everyone wants to meet me. A skinny white guy with long hair walks up to me and half dead. The man tells me his name is Dinky, and that he is the shot caller or leader for the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas gang. It's hard for me to imagine this guy as anyone's leader. He looks like a drug addict to me. I keep my thoughts to myself as he asks me questions. He wants to know if any ABT gang members came with me. I tell him I'm not sure. Our conversation is interrupted when a black inmate starts screaming at the top of his lungs while he runs in a circle on the football field. My eyebrows arch up as I zero in on him. You know who I am? Soldier boy. Any of you fuckers want to get down, let's go. I'll do it to your mama and your heroin-ass daddy. What the hell is the matter with that dude, I asked, bewildered. Both Dinky and Half did start laughing. Dinky says, that dude is a bug out. A what? He's a bug out, a mental health patient, Half Dead interrupts. We call him Soldier Boy. Dude does that shit all day long, bro. Every day, screaming crazy shit. I see Soldier Boy hitting himself in the head with the palm of his hand. Is he really crazy, I ask? Yeah, something ain't right with that nigger, Dinky says, shaking his head. Half Dead laughs again. It's apparent to me, after only a few minutes of observing Soldier Boy that he is mentally ill. It does not take long after that for me to realize that a large portion of inmates are mentally ill. The county jails were flooded with them. Some of their symptoms range from fairly mild, talking to oneself, failing to bathe, to more severe, men who don't know who they are or where they're at. 
Some who light their own cells on fire. Men that are, men that are so hurt that they slash their wrists or attempt to hang themselves from cell bars and fixtures. Stress has a way of worsening almost any condition, and prison is incredibly stressful. Many men have broken down for the first time in their lives when they reach prison. Not only does prison make mentally ill people worse, it also has a way of driving people crazy. And Big Sandy, I'm sure I'll encounter many more men on the brink of being crazy, and others like Soldier Boy, who is already there. The homeboys who sent me the message to come outside never showed up. I say my goodbyes to Dinky and Half Dead, and I work my way back to the housing unit. It is nearing 4 o'clock. Each day at 4, we are locked back into our cells for a head count to make sure we are not only still confined in this concrete jungle, but still alive. Once back in the unit, Mr. Young tells me that my homeboy said to come outside after dinner. They'd been sidetracked earlier in the day. My afternoon in the yard flew by. The small sense of freedom penetrated my inner soul like a hunter's sharp arrow piercing a deer in the wild. For the first time in many years, I was able to walk around unchained. Here there are no cuffs on my hands, no shackles biting into my ankles. The feeling of being a chained dog has dissipated to some degree. I rejoice in this new feeling, but the pain still remains. As I look around the cell, I realize this is my new life. The reality of prison hits me like a ton of bricks. This new life reserved behind concrete walls is steel anger, violence, and most of all, loneliness. Before long, I find myself back on the yard. The atmosphere has changed dramatically since this afternoon. Hundreds of men of all ages and races are milling around the yard. My instincts and my sentences are heightened. The possibilities of bad things happening out here are evident. Instantly, I can feel tension. The fresh air that I enjoyed earlier is now contaminated by a pressure that seems to be lurking on the horizon. In the distance, I see a man about 6'1", 250 pounds with long black hair, beelining in my direction. Within seconds, he is upon me. As his outstretched hand meets my own, he introduces himself. Adam, you must be Chad. Yeah, Chad, how are you? Good, he responds. You need anything? No, man, I'm all set. Well, we knew a white dude from New York was coming. We saw your name on the bus list with an 055 number. So we were waiting on you, Adam says as he clears his throat. Yeah, well, some people told me you wanted to meet me. They kind of gave me the rundown on this place, I say. Is this your first spot, Adam asks? Yeah, first federal prison. Do you know about paperwork? Did anyone tell you about that? Just a little bit in the county jail, I kind of heard you got to get your transcripts or something, I say. Well, what we do is give you 30 days to get your docket sheet, sentencing transcripts, and judgment and commitment, just to make sure you're not a chomo. A what, I respond? A chomo, man. Child molester, or a rat, or a snitch. That type of shit. Nah, man, I'm no chomo, and I went to trial and I got 40 years. Yeah, we had one of the cops check you out already, but that's just general info on their computers. We just need you to get that paperwork. It's your driver's license around here, Adam goes on. I'll write my lawyer of the court and get it for you, I say. Come on, let's spin the yard so I can introduce you to some of the fellas from New York and Boston, Adam says, and we head to the track. The track is similar to the one from my high school days. While we walk, I notice the sun bouncing off the asphalt, making it look like small diamonds are embedded and glistening there. Adam is waving to a group of four or five guys, summoning them. One of the guys that Adam introduces me to is Stone Cold Drunk. He reeks of booze. Being drunk in here has to be like a freight train on a collision course. As I reach out to shake the drunkard's hand, I hear a guy behind us tell Adam that the Serenos are getting are going to hit one of their guys. They're hitting Creeper, he says, and he nods towards the bathroom. My gaze goes from the drunkard to the bathroom area where I can see a bunch of Hispanics milling around one man who I suppose is Creeper. We all focus our attention on the bathroom area. We see the first punch, a sucker punch, and it meets its target. It comes from a man about 6'1", who towers over his prey by at least a foot. The victim stumbles back and his long black hair tumbles and waves from the impact. Creeper begins to swing wildly, but two more inmates pounce at him like wolves on a small buffalo. Within seconds, Creeper falls to the ground like a limp log felled at the hand of a chainsaw operator. I am stunned looking on. Two more Mexican inmates move in and they commence to stabbing their mark with homemade plastic knives. A siren blares over our heads when the first gunshot rings out, startling me. The shotgun blast, a warning shot, echoes through my ears like thunder pounding the side of a mountain in a desolate storm. Creeper seems to be unconscious, but the assault continues. The onslaught of violence reminds me of seeing two pit bulls attacking a person on the TV show when animals attack. These men, too, are animals. Another gunshot rings out, followed by a concussion grenade, fired from the gun tower that is only feet away from the melee. There's a mass confusion now. Prisoners are attempting to flee the area before live rounds are fired. The PA system rings out with instructions. All inmates get on the ground. Shots will be fired. The PA squawks again. In Spanish this time, it sounds like, 
Questese, questese matuso. At least this is what my brain registers as I throw myself to the ground. Looking up from my prone position, I see correctional officers and other staff members running toward the scuffle. More gunshots and the loud siren pierce the air like a broken record repeating the get on the ground instructions in both English and Spanish. Laying in the dirt, I wish I had a battle helmet on. Adam interrupts my thoughts. Yo, Chad, welcome to Vietnam, my friend. Shit gets real around here. You have to get used to it, bro. It happens all the time around here, kid. This shit is crazy, I call back. Yeah, but it's always exciting, and it passes time, he says. If this is how they pass time around here, I think to myself, I'm sure to see a lot of despair. I can only pray that I'm not on the receiving end of passing time. After running into harm's way, the officers have quelled the assault. Creeper seems to be awake, but distraught. Blood flows from his face, and his dirty white t-shirt is adorned with red circles, where his skin was punctured by the makeshift prison shanks. Those who committed the assault are handcuffed and escorted off the yard. Creeper is not cuffed, but he is led off the recreation yard by an officer who holds Creeper's hands behind his back. My mind dances with thoughts while Adam talks to me. I hear him, but whatever he is saying does not register. My stomach, my stomach seems to be twisting and turning like a whirlpool, as I realize that the thought of being shot did not deter these men from continuing their assault. The thought of being shot had no bearing on these deranged men. I cry out silently to God for help. Where am I? Please help me, God. Before long, a voice on the loudspeaker orders us to stand up and to leave the yard when our housing unit is called. The recreation yard is officially closed for the evening, earlier than usual. No complaints from me. As I make my way off the yard, I am sad. I think about how I would rather not smell fresh air or have the wind beat against my back or the rays of sun to beat on my face if it comes at the expense of watching someone being stabbed and brutalized while bullets whiz through the air. On the way back to the housing unit, Adam tells me that he needs to talk to me some more in the morning. He also mentions that it is something important that he wants to introduce me to a guy named Dennis from Boston. We say our goodbyes with handshakes. Paying heed to the wearing shoes to the shower instructions, I gather my hygiene products into a heap and beeline to the shower. I'm concentrating on Adam's words that he has to talk to me about something important. What could be important? The word important sets my mind to juggling, worrying a little bit. Perhaps it is the extreme violence I witnessed that has me on edge. Only time will tell. I mean, that's Big Sandy, man. That's it. That was like an everyday life. Every day, something wild and crazy was happening in that place, man. Every day. And to walk in there and watch this dude just brutalized, you're like, damn, man, I don't even want to be out here when this shit's happening, right? You're thinking, damn, man. You see this shit happening to people and you think, man, this shit could happen to me. This shit could happen on any given day. And I'm new there. I don't even know why they're stabbing this dude. Don't know why, but I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm like, this dude must have done something drastic to be brutalized like that, right? At least that's what you would think. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brutalization, man, happens in federal prison. I've talked about it numerous times. Talked about the top five gangs. And right there, you see the Serenios putting in work as soon as I get there, man. The Southsiders are putting in that work. Playing no games. And you might wonder, why would someone be out there stabbing someone and they're shooting and they don't get down on the ground? It's mind-boggling. I've seen dudes, man, with three, four years left not get on the ground when the cops are shooting. They have to do what they're instructed to do. Or else, you know, like we said before, do the mission or become the mission. That's when you become the mission. That's what that means. The big homie, the shot caller, whoever it is, whatever car, tells you you got to handle this business. We need you. You're up. And if you balk, then you'll be the next guy that he's sending four or five guys to get. And I know some people made comments, right, about, I know I want to kind of talk about this in another video, about how, you know, dudes jump dudes and this and that. And in federal prison, man, right away when we got into that car, it was explained to us that there are no fair ones. There's nothing fair in love and war. We got a mission and our mission is to win. If we got to send 10 people on one dude, that's what we're doing. I mean, that's what's told to us. And that's how things operate. There are no fair ones. <laughs> really, there's not. And, you know, as crazy as this might sound, and I think the baby talked about it in one of the videos. Like, I had a couple fair ones, I guess you could say. I had to crack a kid on the baseball field. We're going to get to that in the book. I had to uh, I had to hit this kid, man, that acted like he was a DWB when I first got into Big Sandy, but he wasn't. He was what we call over there a dick rider. Not to use foul language, but... 
what is a dick rider in prison? It's a dude that like looks up to other dudes like and sweats them. Like, oh man, you're the man, man. I'll do anything for you. Let me go get you a glass of water. You guys are the guys. And uh, his name was Barry. He was out of Missouri. Um, he might be the only white dude, man, out of Missouri that I ever, that never really had that going on. He was pretending. And he was a Big Sandy. And unfortunately, man, I had to tag him over a couple, over a pair of cleats and him telling someone something that I didn't say over a pair of baseball cleats. And I tagged him a couple times. He fell down the handball wall and he didn't do nothing, man. And I'm not saying that to say I'm a tough guy because that's not the point of this channel. It's not the point of the show. I'm just telling you my experiences and things that we did. But again, man, think about that. Think about the things that are important, man. Everybody likes that prison content. And, you know, like I said, we're, we're lovers of violence. We're lovers of, you know, villains. And it's been going on for years, right? Billy the Kid, John Gotti. We want to see the bad guy win a lot. But think about what it was like to walk outside and smell the air, man. Think about that, how I felt when I seen the sun. What it was like to be in that cell, man. What it was like to walk outside finally and smell the air. I promise you, man. I got to get back to the hospital, man. I appreciate you. And I can promise you, there ain't no air like this air. There ain't nothing like having two little boys and say, man, I'm their dad now. No longer in the cell. No longer bound by chains. Blood on the razor wire TV. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share the video. Nothing but love. With respect. Until tomorrow, I'm out.